I'd like to next introduce um, our own Dr. Milton Love from uh, UCSB, a very distinguished marine biologist. That's Milton. <laughs> He apparently watches Stephen Colbert. He does it the same way. Uh, Milton, you gotta come up here though. You gotta talk from here because we got the camera. And um, all these events are videoed and audioed and uh, we do that so that people who can't come at night can get a copy if they need to see it. So um, Milton, with no further view, please. So what I'm gonna do in the next <clears throat> eight minutes apparently is uh, discuss uh, the results of uh, over 20 years of research that my lab and I have done on the role that platforms in California play as, as fish habitat. Um, normally that takes me like an hour and a half. So this is like a scene from hell for me. <laughs> so basically what you're gonna get are some pretty pictures and some overarching statements that are gonna be unsatisfying for all of us. So if you have questions, <clears throat> you can come to my lab, you can email me. I'll send you papers, uh, uh, we can, I'll show you the real PowerPoint, like that. What I'm not gonna do tonight is give you uh, the, the, the kind of the truth about the best decommissioning option, because that's not my job. My job is to give you facts. And I give the same facts to everybody, and because you're all human, you can ignore the facts, you can twist the facts to your philosophy, whatever you wanna do. You paid for it. Most of this research came from federal dollars, so I just give the same facts to everybody. Um, and, and the reason that I can't tell you what is the best decommissioning option is that's not a biological question. That's a philosophical question. And Ronaldo's kind of uh, uh, begun to address that. So for instance, um, there are, in some cases, some years at some platforms, hundreds of thousands of fish not every year and not every platform, but there are always millions of animals living on the, on the jacket, on the superstructure. There's uh, all these invertebrates, mussels and, and crabs and anemones, all these things. And um, if you remove a platform, which is one decommissioning option, you kill them all. So some people go like, well, that's a terrible thing. But if you, as Ronaldo has intimated, if your highest belief is that the oil industry signed a contract saying they would remove the platforms when they're not economical to operate, then that's the most important thing to you. The sea life is of lesser importance. There are people who feel that anything artificial in the ocean is not good. Well, platforms are artificial. And uh, what they want is they want the mud back. There was mud there before there was a platform. And there was a lot of animals living in the mud. They're not there anymore. They want the mud back. And that's not right or wrong. That's just a philosophy. And whatever I have found regarding marine life is of lesser importance. Now, the opposite side of the coin is there are people who go like, well, these seem to be fully functioning reefs. And, and they are. Um, that's what's important to me. Well, OK. That's neither uh, right or wrong. It's neither better or worse than any other philosophy. It's just theirs. And for those people, what I have found, what the people in my lab have found, um, that's, that would be important. But you can see that I'm not going to stand up here and go like, well, one option is better than another. And by the way, the options, there are all kinds of options for decommissioning, but they tend to fall into three categories. One is you completely remove the platform and the underlying shell mount. That's kind of the default. Second one is you cut the platform below the surface uh, at some level. And off California, we tend to talk about maybe 80 or 100 feet below the sea, uh, sea surface, or you can leave them in place. That option is discussed less. It's not impossible, of course, but it's not discussed as much as, for instance, cutting them uh, below the sea surface. So now, having said that, I think in the interest of transparency, I should tell you my own view, because I get to have one as a citizen, not as a biologist, but as a citizen. And my view is there are millions of animals that live on every platform, if you remove the platform, you kill them all. And I think that's an immoral view. That's an immoral thing to do. But that's just my view as a, as a citizen, and hopefully it doesn't impinge on, on my research efforts. I just feel like I have to kind of explain where I'm coming from. So um, very quickly, if we could, oh yeah, okay. Hard to see. So there are the funders. Most of the funding, maybe 90% of the funding since 95 has come from the federal government. 
It came from the National Biological Survey, it came from the US Geological Survey, it came from the Minerals Management Service. And then a small amount has come is laundered money from the oil industry. It, uh, it came from uh, the California Artificial Reef Enhancement Project, which is an NGO completely funded by Chevron. So um, a small amount of all the money I've gotten has been, uh, has been cleaned, it's been laundered. And uh, I actually picked the money up in gold bars in a Bolivian airport. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so no one knows. Well, now they know, now you know. So um, that's where it comes. And the reason I always bring it up is that at least one person in this town has over the years said bad things about me um, because uh, this person claims that I'm kind of the, the shill for the oil industry because a little of my funding has come from the, the oil industry. And let's just call it 10%. So my response always has been, well, if 10% if, uh, of my data is a lie, that's not bad. That's very good. That's a good percentage, really. So I actually got a, a call years ago from my accountant in LA, and he said, there's somebody saying bad things about you on television. I said, well, you know, that's this person's job to, to uh, undermine my credibility. So anyway, there you go. So that's the reason I bring up who funded, who funded this. So now we'll just look at some pretty pictures. <clears throat> there's a typical platform. All platforms in California, basically, well, other than one platform, basically look the same underwater. All platforms are made out of steel, and most platforms look uh, rather simple underwater. They have uh, uh, vertical um, pilings, and um, uh, they're cylindrical. They have cylindrical cross beams, and then they have a whole series of cross beams that run uh, inside, and then they have a whole series of conductor pipes. That's where the oil and gas comes through, which are also these uh, cylindrical pipes. So they're all very standard, except for one platform, uh, Eureka off Long Beach, which is uh, more complex underwater and actually has more uh, ring life because it is more complex. Next. So um, uh, initially, we were tasked with, uh, back in 95, what fishes live around platforms and over nearby natural reefs. And that's really important. You can't just look at a platform and go like, hey, here's what we found. You have to have a frame of reference. What do the natural reefs look like? So that was one. And, and the next one, next slide. And that's the, uh, the big question for every artificial reef is, if you're looking at fishes around a platform or uh, other artificial reef, um, are the fishes being produced by the platform? That is, are there more fishes in Southern California because the platform is there, or are they just aggregating fish? Are they luring fish in from natural reefs? Well, if that's the case, then the platforms aren't enhancing anything. They're just redistributing what's already there. So that was the kind of the two main questions that we've uh, looked at over the years. Next. There you go. There's the kind of the intertidal zone. There's a um, heavy um, muscle layer. The muscle layer extends down 30 or 60 feet on all the platforms off California. And the, the uh, next slide. There's kind of a, a close-up. The, the, um, the jacket, the steel structure, is covered in muscles. Hundreds of thousands, millions and millions of muscles. And then all of the animals that associate with the muscles. So you get um, uh, club anemones that are attached, all kinds of anemones, crabs walking around. Used to be a lot of sea stars. Sea stars all up and down the Pacific Coast got this virus, and they just melted away, and they're slowly coming back, or not, depending on who you believe. But there's still some sea stars there. Next. <clears throat> All kinds of anemones, that's vitridium, the, the white ones, next. And then when you go down uh, 60, 80, 100 feet, you start running out of muscles and you get into other uh, invertebrates. We're just talking invertebrates now. And that happens on natural reefs. There's a succession as you uh, go into deeper and deeper waters. So uh, this is the bottom of platform Gale, uh, about 700 feet of water. So by that time, you're way out of muscles. So now you get king crabs, there's a king crab there, you get gigundic uh, metridiums, those uh, white anemones, they're sponges, they're deep water corals. On, they don't look like um, uh, tropical corals, these are different, but they're corals nonetheless. And they, um, they're found in cold water, so these are cold water corals. Next. Um, and then around all platforms, there is some form of shell mount. As was alluded to, I think Claire alluded to it, 
The platforms are cleaned, usually down to 30 or 60 feet. They're, they're cleaned by divers of, of the overburden of, of invertebrates, and all of those fall to the bottom. Now, if you're in relatively shallow water, uh, 200 feet, uh, like Seth was mentioning at Holly or Grace in 400 and something feet, those all fall kind of straight down. And you get these very thick shell mounds that are 8, 10, or more feet thick of, of shells, and they may extend out a couple hectares. If you're in really deep water, like um, Hondo up above, uh, or uh, like in Las Flores area, or, or the ones that are up above Conception, uh, Hermosa, then as the shells fall, they get carried out by currents. So you don't get this thick layer, but you get scattered shells all, all over the place. And this habitat is unique to, to the area around platforms. There is no uh, habitat like this, uh, certainly anywhere in California and maybe not in most of the world. And there's a whole group of invertebrates that uh, occupy uh, those shells uh, exclusively. Uh, they tend to be nursery grounds. These are little crabs that are about the size of a half dollar next. And lots of sea stars, at least before they all melted away next. Uh, spot prawns. I mean, there's some economically important um, uh, invertebrates next. So, um, so that's the invertebrates. We didn't focus most of our research on invertebrates, a little bit, but not much. Uh, but then we did, we focused primarily on fishes. The top 100 feet, we, uh, we meaning the people in my lab, I'm just kind of a pretty face. Everybody else does the heavy lifting. The, uh, we have scuba divers who, who survey fishes down to 100 feet, and then we use that little two-person submarine for going down to the bottom, and the, the deepest platform is in 1,200 feet, and so we use the uh, sub to look at 100 feet down to 1,200, depending on the platform. Next. <clears throat> and then uh, all, of the, all of those uh, submersible um, surveys, we have a, a video camera that videotapes everything. We voice over it. Those two tubes there are uh, ruby lasers. So when we look out the port of the sub, there are two red dots. And that tells us, gives us an idea of what 20 centimeters are, so we can not only identify all the fish we see as we go along the platform, we can make an estimate of their length. Next. Um, that kind of gives you a schematic of what we do. We go down the bottom, we go out maybe 20 feet, and we go all the way around the platform and count the fishes on the shell mound. We go into the, the just on the outside of the platform, at the bottom, go all the way around, and then we go up every cross beam. And those cross beams are maybe 40 meters apart, 30 meters apart, and we go as high up as we can until the current gets too bad. And that's how we survey the fishes. Next. I'll show that that's a, an image of where all the um, platforms are. Uh, everything that has a star, we have surveyed. The uh, green uh, dots are platforms that either are too shallow for us or too far south. And basically, every platform now has been surveyed for fishes by somebody uh, at least once, and in, in, in our case, sometimes 15 or 20 or even more times. Next. And this also shows you all the places in California, Southern California, where we've taken the sub and surveyed on natural reefs. So we've basically uh, done surveys all the way out to the edge of the continental shelf before you just drop off into the abyss. Uh, and and the, the, you know, the, the take home message is that. Uh, all natural reefs have been heavily fished, some less and some more, but you, you could go out 120 miles before you drop off, and most of the fish there are less than a foot and a half long, because there's been a century of recreational fishing, millions of people recreational fishing, and commercial fishing, both. So, heavily overfished areas. Next. Um, that's a take home message as far as fish are concerned, not all platforms. Uh, are created equal, and in fact, every platform is slightly different. There are similarities, but there are also differences. Next. Uh, but if you held a gun to my head and said you have to make a gener series of generalities, okay, here's what we would say. First of all, there's a group of fishes that are kind of semi-pelagic. They swim in in a big school, and they take a look around, and then they leave, and the platforms have no influence on whether, you know, where they are or why they're there. So, Jack mackerel, Pacific mackerel, bonita, um, anchovies, things like that. You, you go down one day and you see a whole bunch like, like there, you come back the next day and they're gone because it's just not 
uh, it's not their habit. Next. And then in the shallowest parts of platforms, you see all the typical reef fish that you would see on a natural reef. These are uh, Garibaldi, for instance, higher densities of Garibaldi than you would normally see on a platform, but typical species. Next. Uh, sheephead, same kind of thing, very typical um, species of near shore natural reefs. Next. <clears throat> this is the big difference. So these are all juvenile rockfishes. Rockfishes are the dominant group of fishes on the Pacific coast. Every marine habitat has at least one species, and some, some may have 15 or 20 species, big economically important group of fishes. Uh, what you, the, the biggest difference between uh, uh, platforms and natural reefs is that platforms tend to be better, I shouldn't say that, they tend to have higher densities of young rockfishes. Uh, than do typical natural reefs. And that's not because uh, platforms have been sprinkled by pixie dust or magical places where everybody plays the lute and, and, and sings songs. They could be that, but we never saw anybody do that. So, If you give me some money, I'll test that hypothesis out. So anyway, um, it's it, 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 there's actually a very good biological reason. And, um, and that is that uh, most of these very young rockfishes drift around in the plankton when they're like a quarter of an inch long. And at some point they want to settle out. They want to settle out on something hard and they don't care what it is. They don't care if it's a rock, if it's a sewer pipe, if it's a tire or if it's a platform. Uh, and they're about, oh, on average 50 feet, 80 feet below the, the surface. And they're much more likely to encounter a platform which covers the entire water column than a reef which may be right near the platform, but it's like 150, 200, 500 feet down. So it's just the encounter rate is much higher for these young fishes. And that's the reason you almost always have higher densities of <coughs> these young fishes at a platform than you do at, at a natural reef. So that's the midwater. There's a community of fishes in the midwater, and at the bottom you tend to get bigger fish. So if the midwater tends to be a place where you have young small fish, the bottom is a place where you have uh, older and larger fish. And the reason uh, you tend to get um, higher densities of larger fish at platforms than at nearby reefs is that platforms act as de facto marine reserves. That is, they weren't set up as marine reserves, but there tends to be less fishing around them than at natural reefs. And part of that is that some platforms sit in the middle of just horrendous weather. The ones above conception, it's awful. Who's going to go up there and fish? Even if you're a commercial fisherman, it's just not worth it. And part of it is that the oil industry really doesn't like, particularly after 9-11, they don't like random people coming up and boats they don't know, and they'll call the Coast Guard on you if you try to come up and, and fish next to them. I once asked um, a guy who worked on Platform Gale if the crew people on the platforms fish. So I really wanted to get a handle on the fishing effort. And he said, uh, this is years ago, he said, uh, well, you know, after you get off a shift, you don't want to fish. All you want is a dove bar. And I went, I went oh. He said, yeah, and uh, now that Veneto owns scale, we don't get dove bars. <laughs> huh. Yeah, and I don't like the apples either. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going like, Really? He said, yeah, we used to get uh, Fuji's. Now we get Red Delicious. I hate Red Delicious. I'm like, to myself, I'm going like, like, what's my role here? Is this like a labor thing? I can sing labor songs. I can sing with this guy, Joeville, probably. But, and then he went on to other things. But, but I established there was relatively little fishing anyway on this platform. So platforms generally have larger fishes at the bottom because there's less fishing uh, intensity. Uh, than around most natural reefs. And what that leads to, so these are Boccaccio overfished, uh, federally listed overfished species, probably got down to about 10% of its virgin stock, has been rebuilt, it's no longer overfished. But at one time, when I took this shot back in whatever, 1997, the highest densities of, of adult Boccaccio in Southern California were probably on this one platform, platform Gale. Not that it was magical, but there wasn't much fishing going on. Next. And this is even uh, more intense. This is a cow cod, another economically important fish. That was down to about 3% of its unfished levels, and by far the highest densities we saw 
was again at Platform Camp. I actually have a tattoo on my arm of a cow. I really like it. So, uh, next. Um, okay, so that's the bottom of the platform, and then at the sh on the shells, our old favorite shell mounds, um, you, you get similar fish living on the platform, but they tend to be the younger stages. Or they tend to be fishes that never get very big. So you tend to get these schools of these half-banded rockfish, 10, 15, 20,000 of them, swimming around. Next. Or there's a juvenile cow cow that's probably the size of my thumb. So you get the juveniles in the, on the shells, and then when they get old enough, they move over to the platform and, and uh, we assume live their life as an adult. I, I don't have proof that they stay there forever, but that's an assumption. Next. <clears throat> okay, um, th then I, I'm about to just give you a bunch of airy-fairy overarching statements, but I want to do one more uh, uh, very specific thing. So, this is a slide that looks at fish production around platforms and compares it to fish production on other kinds of marine habitats. And really, I was kind of expecting I could stick my finger underneath this, but let me tell you what fish production is, or what production is. Production is a metric that's used all over the world <clears throat> as a way of comparing um, the, the the value, I hate to say that, but the value of a habitat. And basically, production is composed of two things. How many of a group of things there are, their density, and how fast they're growing, how fast they're putting on carbon, okay? And um, previous to the study we did at Platforms, there, there was a convention that, well, the highest secondary productivity, fish productivity in the world are found in estuaries. So people said, oh, estuaries, very productive or on some coral reefs, very productive, and, and they are. So when we did the study, and I did not do the study, Jeremy Clays at Cal State Pomona took the data we had looking at the fish populations around platforms, and he did a, a model, and he showed that every platform that he looked at in California, fish production was higher at every single platform than at any other habitat in the world. Does that mean, literally, it has the highest productivity anywhere in the world? No, we haven't done every habitat in the world. This was just from published literature. This is all we had. Does that mean that every single year this is true? No, this is only based on the data he has. But the implication is that these platforms, you could argue, based on that study, are, are quite productive as far as uh, the fishes are concerned, using this, this metric. Thanks. Okay, so what did uh, what have we learned since uh, 1995? <laughs> okay, we've all seen the humor of it next. Okay, okay so I'm just going to read these to you. In broad terms, there are two fish assemblages around most California platforms. There's one in midwater, and the other around the platform base and the associated shore. Next. The water columns within many platforms serve as rockfish nursery grounds and nursery grounds for other uh, species of fish, but rockfish is dominant. Young of the year rockfish, that is uh, juvenile rockfish, densities around many platforms are greater than those at most natural reefs. Now, is this true for every platform? No. If you go to Emmy or Eva, the ones that are uh, uh, off uh, Huntington Beach in 45 feet of water, it's probably not true. There haven't been very many studies, but the ones that have been done by Chris Lowe's students at Long Beach State imply that that's not true. So it's not every single platform, but it's probably true of many platforms. Next. Some platforms act as de facto marine reserves. Is that true for every platform? No. It's uh, probably not true for a couple platforms off Long Beach where uh, sport fishing party boats have been kind of grandfathered in, and they'll come up right next to them, and they'll have 40 people fishing them. So it's probably not true for some platforms. Probably true for the majority of platforms. Next. Uh, as with natural plat uh, reefs, platforms both produce and aggregate fishes. Platforms may be regionally uh, important in enhancing fish production. So, population. So, um, that's the beauty of platforms. They're, in, in that sense, just like natural reefs. If you told me, you know what? The most important fish to me is the kelp bass. That do platforms help the kelp bass population? I would say no. And that's almost certainly true. 
if you said to me, well, uh, how about the Boccaccio, overfish? Do you think that because platforms are there, the uh, Boccaccio population rebounded faster than if the platforms weren't there? I would go like, yep, probably true, because we have a, a study that showed that. So it depends on what species you're interested in. It depends, again, on kind of your philosophy of all this. Next. On average, okay, so that is the last one. On average, fishes around platforms are uh, neither more nor less contaminated than fish from natural reefs. So that, that's a very valid question. Platforms are not places where they're producing cotton candy, right? Platforms are industrial facilities. There's, uh, there used to be drilling going on. You have to lubricate the bits with, with drill muds. Drill muds, historically, not so much anymore, used to have high levels of uh, barium and cadmium and all kinds of stuff. You've got water that comes up with the oil and gas. In some cases, you actually pour the water into the ocean. Those things have pollutants. So you would expect that it to be possible that fishes around platforms would be more heavily polluted with certain heavy metals, for instance, than the same species further away. So we got money from the Minerals Management Service, collected fish uh, near platforms and away from platforms, sent the fish to a lab in Missouri, and they said, Statistically, there wasn't a difference. Now, is that true for all species of fish? I have no idea. We only picked two or three species. Is it true for every platform? Nope. I have no idea. We only did it for like six platform natural area comparisons. But there, there doesn't seem to be any overt uh, data that shows that, that these uh, fishes are more polluted than, than further away. I think that's it. Oh, oh. California oil and gas platforms are among the most productive. Well, I already said that. So that's it. I ran over my eight minutes, but I'm kind of proud of myself. Entertaining. <laughs>